Why am I here? Why am I here? A few weeks ago, we gave two answers to this question out of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. It was in verse 13 and Solomon, after writing the entire book, comes up to a conclusion that everything in life is pointless and worthless if not having the focus of eternity. And he closes the book with the conclusion that says, The conclusion of all of these thoughts, let them be heard, fear God and obey His commandments. For this is what it means to be human. But this morning I would also like us to give one more answer to that question of why am I here? One more reason for your existence in this world and your place in your pew. <laughs> Today I'm going to take two seemingly unrelated ideas and at the conclusion I'm going to bring them together to hopefully find our answers of why am I here. Forgive me for how my mind works, but it, they are two very different ideas <laughs> and you'll just have to bear with me. Last week, Joseph and I, as we were going through our missions trip, we roomed together the entire week. Poor guy. He had to suffer with me. <laughs> As we were going through each night, we were trying to do a Bible study together and we would read a passage of scripture and then we'd discuss it. And so of all places, we took the book of James. It's a fun book. It's a place for all kinds of conviction and good discussion that did come out of it. Probably several sermons that you're going to hear in the future <laughs> will come out of the discussions that he and I had. In James chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, you don't have to turn there. Um, it's on the screen. James makes a very audacious claim. And this is what he said. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain and the earth produced its fruit. That's a pretty strong claim. James says that Elijah had a nature like ours. The International Standard Version, this is the New King James, International Standard Version says it this way, Elijah is a, was a man just like us. Okay, sure James. And then James, to just kind of rub it in, adds some more information about that. He says not only was he just like us, but he prayed that it wouldn't rain for three and a half years. And guess what? It didn't. And then when he prayed again that it would rain, it did rain. Now, I don't know about you. I'm a terrible gardener. And maybe that's the reason my gardens don't do so well. But I have never prayed for it to, rain, to drought for three and a half years. And it's done it. Now, granted, I've never prayed that either, but Elijah was a man just like you and me. How's your prayer life? Just like Elijah's? Well, that idea was turning over in my mind over this last week after we had read through that. And it brought me about to 1 Kings chapter 19, where our main passage is. And we're going to start with reading verse 9. But I want you to keep this in the back of your mind that James tells us Elijah, that prophet Elijah, the greatest prophet in the Old Testament, some say, was just like you and me. Let's start. Uh, when you go to chapter 19, chapter 18, they're talking about his great victory on Mount Carmel. And I should have probably shown you some pictures of Mount Carmel from when I was there in Israel. But it talks about the 450 prophets of Baal and fire coming down from heaven, consuming the altar after he'd done everything to make that altar, that offering not burn up. He has that wonderful victory. Then from chapter 19, verses 1 through 8, this is kind of the background. Jezebel, after hearing that her prophets and prophetesses had all been killed, she promises that she's going to kill Elijah. So Elijah runs for a day. He's exhausted. He lays down underneath a tree and God provides for him with food. 
He pleads God to just kill him. His life was over. He said, My, it's all done. I've done all I can do. Just kill me now. God feeds him and he runs for another 40 days and 40 nights on the food that he'd been given. And he comes to a place that we know well called Mount Sinai or Mount Ararat. Mount Sinai, not Ararat. Sorry. So verse 9, Elijah is up in a cave on Mount Sinai. And let's read what took place. And there he went into a cave and he spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Plausible question, I guess. So Elijah said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, they've torn down your altars, and they've killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left. And now they seek to take my life. Forty days prior to this conversation, he's asking God to take his life. Just kill me now. I've done all I can do. <laughs> My life's over with. I've accomplished all I can do. Now, 40 days later, he's in hiding in the furthest place he could possibly get out in the middle of the wilderness. He's hiding. So God comes to him and says, Elijah, why are you here? Elijah answers how most of us would. God, I'm here because of my circumstances. Because of the things happening around me, it's got me stuck in this cave. You know, uh, Jezebel is after my life. She wants to kill me. There's no other prophets or prophetesses left for, from your nation for, for you. Just the way life happened, I'm... Just here. But God wasn't satisfied with Elijah's answer. So God has Elijah go and stand at the opening of the cave. Verse 11. Then God says, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, and it broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Elijah sees all kinds of power. God says, I want you to come out here to the entrance of your cave. I want to show you a few things. He sees God pass by. He sees a wind that's so strong, it literally starts ripping the mountain apart. Then he sees a massive earthquake and a great fire. But he says the Lord wasn't in any of those. Not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. And finally, after all of that takes place, I don't know about you, but I'd have probably been shaking in my boots. After all that takes place, God speaks to Elijah in a still small voice. Just like you and me. Elijah was looking for God to do something great. Send down fire again, Lord. He was looking for God in that powerful earthquake. He was looking for God in that mighty wind. He was looking for God in the miraculous fire. By the way, that just by chance is also the same place where Moses saw the bush that was on fire that didn't burn up. But you see, the greatest miracle of God is that the all-powerful Creator the holy judge of the entire universe, all creation, can speak to your heart and mine, and we are not obliterated. Now, you don't have to turn there, but Psalm 29, verses 3 through 9, talks about the voice of the Lord. Let me read it for you. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The glory of God thunders. 
The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. He makes them also skip like a calf, Lebanon and Syrian, like a young and wild ox. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple, everyone says glory. It was God's words that created all things. It was by, it will be by his words that all of heaven and the universe, all of the stars will be wiped away. It is also that same voice that speaks softly to us down to our feeble hearts to draw us carefully and compassionately to Him. What a miracle. So upon hearing this still small voice, Elijah covers his face and God asks Elijah the same exact question. Verse, 12, verse 13. And so it was when Elijah heard the still small voice that he wrapped his face in his mantle and he went out and he stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? God didn't like Elijah's answer the first time, so he gives it to him again. And Elijah says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars and they've killed your prophets with the sword. And I alone am left and they seek to take my life. By the way, we talked about it, I think, Friday night. When God gives you a test and he doesn't like your answer, guess what you're going to get again? The same test. Just a hint. If he gives it to you again, don't write down the same answer you did last time. Because <laughs> then you get to retake it again. God asks Elijah two times, why are you here, Elijah? Both times Elijah gives the same answer. God, I'm here because of my circumstances. I'm here because it's just life. People made choices, I made choices, you made choices, we all made choices, and I'm just here. I'm just a product of the circumstances around me. I'm stuck in this cave because Jezebel wants to kill me. God says, that's not true. I'm not satisfied with that answer, Elijah. He isn't seeing what God is really asking him. So God gives the answer to Elijah. Elijah. That God was waiting for. Then by giving Elijah the answer, God also gives Elijah the deeper question that he was asking that Elijah missed. Let's go cover it. Verse 15. After asking him twice, why are you here? Then the Lord said to him, go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel king over Syria also you shall anoint Jehu the son of Nimshi as king over Israel, and Elisha the son of Shaphat of Abel-Methola you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there and he found Elisha, the son of Shaphat. God's answer to Elijah was not one that you might expect. The question was, why are you here, Elijah? God's answer that he wanted from Elijah was, well, I've got stuff to do. God says, Elijah, the answer is, I want you to go. I've got a job for you. His answer was detailed. I'm going to tell you what you're going to do for the rest of your life. Literally. He wasn't there because of his circumstances. He was there because God had something for him to do. Elijah was not on this earth just because of chance or circumstance. 
but because God had something specific for Elijah to do, and it would literally change Israel and Judah's history. God gave Elijah a different worldview. What, was, what would happen if God asked you this morning, why are you here? What answer would you give? Why are you here? Why are you here in service? Why do you live where you live? Why do you work where you work? Why are you retired at the age that you're retired? Why do you have so many kids? Why are you married to this person or that? Why are you here? You see, I think this is where Jane's audacious statement really shines through. Go to the next slide. As we look from where Elijah did, over the valley, from the door of that cave, we often have the same idea that he had. Well, I'm here because life happened. I'm here because my parents fell in love. I'm here because I decided when I got out of high school that I was going to do this or I was going to do that. <laughs> Some of us might even go as far as to say, I'm here because I flipped the coin. God says, no, you're not. God gives us the same decree that he gave Elijah. You're here because I want you to be here. You're not here to just soak in oxygen particle, particles and cycle them back out. Your life is more than that. Your life is more than the circumstance that you're in. The decisions that have been made around your life or the decisions that you have. You are cycling oxygen particles because He has a job for you. And guess what? When you're done with that job, that'll be the last oxygen molecule you'll ever take in. Because He'll be done with you. Then you can move on and you'll never need Him again. Woohoo! He has a job specifically for you that He wants you to do. Now I want to take us to the seemingly unrelated thought. It came about because of our Hebrew study. My mind works weird. I love to find connections all over the Bible. When Jesus died... What took place? You remember? There was an earthquake. Oh, that sounds similar, similar to our story, doesn't it? As a matter of fact, in both passages from 1 Kings 19 and then in Matthew, I believe it's 27, the, the earthquake was so severe that the rocks split apart. <clears throat> Instead of a fire, though, what did they have at Jesus' death? Darkness for three hours. Instead of a still small voice, Christ gave a loud cry and gave up the ghost. But there was one more thing that happened at Jesus' death that didn't come into play for Elijah. That's exactly right, Joseph. The veil was torn in two from top to bottom. Now I know this is a weird thought. Why in the world come go from Elijah hearing from God to talking about Jesus dying on the cross and having supernatural things take place? But as we were going through our Hebrew study, we came across this verse, verse in Hebrews chapter 10. If you want the greater significance to what the verse means, you're going to have to go to the YouTube channel, Shameless Plug, uh, where the Bible studies are archived. But to the point of this sermon, particularly, the writer of Hebrews gives us a clue why the veil was torn at Jesus' death. Verse 19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and a living way which He consecrated for us through the veil, that is, His flesh. The temple veil was a very tall curtain. 
as wide as a man's hand. Stitched beautifully with uh, beautiful fabric and designs. But what its purpose was, was to separate the Holy of Holies where God's very presence stayed and then the holy place where the priests would go in and then ultimately the rest of the world. It was the separation between a holy God and a sinful people. <laughs> Hebrews tells us here that when Jesus died and the veil was ripped from top to bottom, it moved the separation away. You see, before that, there was no pass-through of the veil. You had to crawl under the veil, underneath this separation, to be able to get to God's presence. And the high priest would only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement after doing sacrifices for his own sin and the sin of the people. But when Jesus died and it was ripped in two, it separated. There was no longer a separation, I should say, between a holy God and the people of the world. The only prerequisite is that you had to go, as it mentions here in verse 19, through the body of Christ. The veil was a visual representation of the spiritual truth that it is through Jesus that we have free access to the Father into God's very presence. In fact, Hebrews even tells us that we can come through with boldness. Now I know this seems, again, very unrelated, but I'm about to bring them together. Church tradition tells us because think about this. To be able to do sacrifices in the temple, they had to have the veil. <laughs> there had to be a separation. If there was no separation between God's presence and the people, there's no reason for a sacrifice anymore. So they had to have the veil. Church tradition tells us that the temple priests, after the temple veil was ripped in two, they went back together. Picture this in your mind. The priests got back together and they tried sewing back together the temple veil. But they also tell us that it was never effective. It's roughly 38 years after the temple veil being rent in two, the entire temple was destroyed. But for somewhere around 38 years, they kept trying to sew it back together. Think about that. Far be it from me as your pastor that I would try and create, try and sew back together a veil of separation between you and God that Jesus himself tore down. Heaven help me. I don't want to put anything in your way between finding him. How terrible it would be to sew up the veil that Jesus, him very, his very self, tore down. Here we go, coming in for a landing. After the temple veil was torn, where was God's presence? Right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Do you not know that now you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God Almighty dwells in you? God's very presence after the temple veil was torn, Pentecost took place, now the temple of God is you and I. He dwells in us. When you're out and about, and you're interacting with the people that God has placed in your circle. I want to ask a question. Do they have the same bold access to God's presence that Jesus died for, for you to have? Or have you been sewing up the veil? Am I making sense? You see, when I started the sermon, the question was, why am I here? Like God explained to Elijah, it's not because of your circumstance that you are here. It's not because you just simply decided to get out of bed and come to church this morning. 
No, the reason you're taking in and putting out oxygen is because God has a job for you to do. So why are you here? What is he telling you to do? Our job is to carry around the free access to God's presence everywhere we go. When Jesus died and the temple veil was torn, the access to the Father was free and we could come with boldness now. You and I now, since Pentecost, the Holy Spirit dwells in us, God's very presence. And it is our job to literally have everyone that comes around us have free access to the Father wherever we go. Right before I left for Cuba, I was strongly challenged that every place that we would go is where God's presence is, where the light is. And that same light dispels the darkness wherever it goes. God's Holy Spirit, every place you time, every time, wow, you put your foot in place in Kroger or Walmart or the gas station or church or the bank, you're taking God's free access to everyone around you. You are not here by circumstance. You're not here simply because you chose to be. You are here because God has a job for you to do. And that is to share His presence with everyone you come in contact with. But here's the deeper question. If you know the job that you have to do, are you trying to sew back up the veil? Are you trying to put provisos? Are you trying to hide a little bit? Are you holding back your words? Are you holding back your actions? You see, the, the world out there desperately needs love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. Don't believe me, just read the headlines. You know the only way they're going to get that? Is if they find the one that gives it. You know the only way they find it? Is if you tell them. How can they understand without a preacher? What happens if you stop speaking? What happens if you start sewing up the separation between them and God again? Oh, heaven help us, we never do that. Why are you here? You are here to share God's presence in every circumstance of your life. Every relationship of your life. As someone did that for you. Would you stand with me? Hi everyone. Thank you so much for watching. It really does mean the world to me that you're getting a blessing out of it. If this video was a blessing, make sure to hit that thumbs up button for me. That way other people can find it as well. Here in the link section, you'll find playlists and new videos that we put out. We try to do two or three a week. You can also subscribe to the channel uh, by pressing on my face and then hitting the bell icon, and that will alert you to new videos. May God richly bless you.